my fellow co-workers, peers, and friends. Thank you to Mass Culture. Thank you, Robin, for the invitation to share my thoughts as we collectively take up the challenge to address our future future of art. I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. I live and work on the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Huron-Wandat. This territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon Wapam Belt Covenant and is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. I am grateful for the teachings and relations of the Indigenous peoples. Today in my talk, I want to offer a perspective and some big picture thinking with the intent that it will help us to address some system noise that we often encounter in such an endeavor. More importantly, the need to account for our current status and understand how we arrived at this juncture and crossroads. I have these five guiding questions to help in unpacking my thoughts. First, what does the macroeconomics scenario imply? for the political economy of the culture sector? How does it impact the labor of the artist? What are the sectorial priorities and desired shifts? What kind of future are we looking at? And how do ASOs reconfigure and recalibrate in these shifting times? A reading of the current moment in history points towards the shifts underway which are clearly part of a larger cultural transition, invoking more than just arts. Today, we are facing three crises, a public health one with the pandemic and other outcomes of that with mental health, for example, the social, the social upheaval foregrounded by the inquiry, which has foregrounded social movements across different sections of our society, such as indigenous decolonization movement, Black Lives Matter, etc., and the economic crisis. And this precarity is accentuated by the pandemic, the impending recession, the high cost of living, inflation, and what we will see coming is austerity. But more importantly, beyond the three crises at this juncture, we're witnessing two key indicators. One, four generations living together, boomer to zoomer. And two, the breakdown of supply chains. We also see through media and across multiple platforms a narrative about our present condition and how that's being built. We're continuously told by the leaders of industry through their myriad spokespersons, AKA consultants, as to how there's no going back to old ways. What does that imply? Simply, there's talk about the myth of a new normal, as well as life under a lockdown is well portrayed in this last quote. And what I'm pointing to is how such historical moments generate a particular discourse across different modalities of institutions, disciplines, and community networks. Then on another note, there are two types of discourses that are at play. One is the socio-political discourse, and two is the corporate management discourse. But here what I want to highlight is how in the current situation, instead of social political leaders, how and why the corporate slash business leaders have become more influential. We see this manifestation at many levels and instances, be it in philanthropy or social issues or politics. The public tends to listen to what the business leadership has to say on this. For example, statements against systemic racism began with corporate bodies as part of their public relations. It was not long before everyone started following suit, including the art world. This has been going on for several decades. The genesis of the overbearing of business leadership on social issues stems from the interesting moment in history in 1987. And here I'm alluding to the invention of the diversity and inclusion apparatus by the Rand Corporation's 1987 report, Workforce 2000. Now, some of you have heard me speak about this. Diversity and inclusion has nothing to do with anti-racism. On the contrary, it's a productivity tool. But this corporate discourse has embedded itself into the systems to mean and imply something that it is not. And what does this result in? 
my observation is that the deeper the crises, the stronger the tendency among apologists of the system towards self-delusion or denial. This self-delusion is often structured in the binary of problem and solution, wherein to any challenge the retort is, what is your solution? This state of denial, a characteristic feature of dominant ideologies, may be indispensable in the effort to restore hegemony, but it also runs the risk of leaving the ideology exposed, particularly when its own diktats seem to compound the crisis rather than resolve it. And here I'm directly implying to the embeddedness of neoliberalism in our systems. The same strident self-delusion can be seen in arts, culture, education, social welfare. Neoliberal assumptions about the role in the economy not only offer no plausible solutions, either social, political, or educational, to the present crisis, but also involve a deep demeaning view of the role of individuals in society. Now, this makes me pose the question, have artists embraced a narrative about themselves? And if so, why? And what does it tell us about the current state of arts? Let's try and unpack this question further. There are three phases of this journey of artist to creatives, and we need to understand this journey because it tells us more about the political economy of our own sector. We see how in the first phase, we see the making of the artist as a professional. In the second phase, we see the making of the artist as entrepreneur. And lastly, it has been reduced to this idea of creatives. Each of these phases represent a distinct shift in the political economy, as we shall see more in detail later. And some of you may wonder, what do I mean by the political economy? And by political economy, I mean the study of production, trade, and their relationship with law and the government. It is the study of how economic theories affect different socio economic systems, along with the creation and implementation of public policy. And this includes the arts. Now, here you're able to see the transitioning role of artists and its political economy. From the post-war period to the 1970s, we see a clear indication of how the artists, through the process of institutionalization, were turned into professionals and with the stated attempt to make them part of the middle class. Now, we all know there's a ministry for the middle class. This is the moment of origins of the ASOs. The Massey Report of 1951 establishes the architecture of what Canadian culture should be and lays out the institutional process. Canada Council for the Arts, the CBC, the National Archives, art galleries and museums, and many, many other institutions and other things emerge with the idea also of Canadian content. 1970s to the 1990s is the period of the onset and establishment of neoliberalism. In simple terms, the market becomes the champion through free trade and culture becomes one of the commodities to be traded. This process was not simple and so many upheavals. I was very much involved during these decades in many of the debates and contestations to protect the interests and rights of artists. New ideas like managerialism, supply chain were introduced in a decolonizing world during the times of Thatcher and Reagan. It did not take much time to reach what is now known as the Washington Consensus. And this consensus was nothing but a set of 10 economic policy prescriptions, which created a reform package for the crisis-ridden third world supervised by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the U.S. Department of Treasury. In ordinary language, this was the moment when the idea of exporting labor, understood as labor to the third world, understood as outsourcing, and importing finished products into the country, you know, think of Walmart or the made in Bangladesh or the Apple phone made in China. This is what we arrived at as a profitable business proposition. Between 1997 and 99, the new Labour Party under Tony Blair in the United Kingdom completely commodified the idea of culture. First, he changed the name of the department to the Department of Culture, Media and Sports. Now it is called the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sports. And this move led to the institutionalization of the creative economy. 
And this became a template when the world followed the Pied Piper Richard Florida with mayors and politicians blindly embracing creative economy because it addressed their political expediency. Culture was divided into 13 sectors to 22 sectors, depending on who you followed. By 2009, UNESCO introduced the business idea of the value chain for the culture sector and committed value chain analysis. Now, the value chain analysis is essentially the tool that lets policymakers makers, project managers, or cultural entrepreneurs gain an understanding of the causes for market underperformance by identifying the reasons for market failure. So the focus was only market, not artist. And in the last two decades, we see IT joining hands with the market, making it the winner-takes-all model. And this cycle completes the death of the artist. William Doretzowitz, has precisely written on the new paradigm in the digital age, one that is changing our fundamental ideas about the nature of art and the role of artists in society, how we are embedded in an IT and market paradigm, which is dictating the terms. And you can see the image uh, of the book on the slide. And he relates to two narratives symptomatic of deeper shifts. One is the Silicon Valley boosterism. There's never been a better time to be an artist. Anyone can easily market. We see this being spun as creators who got tired of waiting to be chosen, took to the web, and saw their work go viral. The second, the artist's tale, is different. Everyone can produce and post your work. As a result, we may now have universal access to the audience, but at the price of universal impoverishment. Left to fend for themselves in the marketplace, artists have been forced to practice creative entrepreneurship with less time to spend building an oeuvre or perfecting the technique and more time to be spent on networking and self-promoting. User reviews and recommendation engines matter more to them than critical opinion. Their work tends to be tamer, safer, more formulaic, more like entertainment, less like art. Doretzowitz contends even very moderately successful artists often struggle. In the 1980s, 80% of music album revenue went to the top 20% of content. Now it goes to the top 1%. Among other things, he observes as to how the current model works, quote, the only way the current model works if you are young, healthy, and childless. And this is a typical neoliberal construction of the productive individual. What we're witnessing now is a political segregation of work, labor, and jobs. Work is an intended activity that is accomplished through free will. Labor equals to produce goods and services in an economy, and it's based on abilities, skilled, unskilled, and professional. And jobs can be willed, managed, and or measured. At the core of entrepreneurial societies, how to generate sustained and sustainable economic growth is built on high-value, well-paying jobs. This shows how labor was outsourced and became part of the globalization and supply chain. As Doretzowitz points out, the IT and market consolidation resulted in the nature of precarious jobs that we know today, call it by any name, gigs, self-employment, creative, etc. For the last while, what I'm trying to explain through this relationship between work, labor, and job is that the present focus on jobs and how the current political discourse is situating the idea of work under the umbrella of reform, buzzword innovation, and its exigencies have tapered even more finely to the perceived needs of the labor market. Similarly, the skills development agenda is another buzzword of neoliberalism. Do you ever notice how pervasive this agenda is and how tightly controlled it is? For example, you will see its prevalence from the funding of community arts projects to the education sector. The skills learning outcomes model has thus become a uniform point of reference for a cluster of other management-driven concepts which have contributed in the neoliberal era to the transformation of the landscape, the culture, social, and education sectors. But the most critical impact has been on the political segregation into this tripartite division of work, labor, and jobs. The current politics is driven by the concept of jobs while work has been left out. This has a direct impact on the idea of work of artists. We have lost our agency. Recently, listening to the governor of the Bank of Canada 
brought back memories of my economics professor Kenji Okuda at Simon Fraser University in the late 70s. The three major concerns or issues of macroeconomics are unemployment levels, inflation, and economic growth. Both the 1980, 81, 82 recessions were triggered by the tight monetary policy in an effort to fight mounting inflation. During the 60s and 70s, the economists and policymakers believed that they could lower unemployment through higher inflation, a trade-off known as the Phillips curve. In other words, for people in the North Economic and Political Commentary, it is now known more as the Paul Volcker myth, a myth that won't die. The imperative of establishing the conducive equation between labor and capital is defining our social and political order. It has been a site of contestation as much as the saliency of the human condition of our contemporary times. One fact that stirs us is that credit is the most fungible commodity. As it is known widely, the globalized nature of credit speaks to how false assumptions are that the central bank could cause a recession or a slowdown in aggregate demand by raising the rate. Today, we are governed by what is considered the new consensus macroeconomics. For people familiar with the domain, irrespective of their views, the Bank of Canada's new mandate offers a clear insight into how labor is understood. Maximum sustainable employment, which for critics is highly uncertain and is determined by factors outside the control of the central bank. Isn't it then not surprising? Surprising, the reason why most central banks do not have explicit and formal targets for employment. And here I'm reminded by the wonderful and powerful book by political economist Clara E. Matai, who explores the intellectual origins of austerity to uncover its originating motives. She interrogates the economic policies of austerity, cuts to wages, fiscal spending, and public benefits as a path to solvency and poses the obvious and important question, what if solvency was never really the goal? Over the last two years, you will have heard me say this. I have repeatedly said, today, the world of labor looks a lot like the way art labor has looked for decades. This is why I introduced the issue of decommodified labor as the first element of the argument. In the last few years, there's been an increase in the focus on the idea of artistic labor, questions of waged work, and what is the place of art in such a reassessment of work. Often these debates have been grouped into three schools, refusal of work, anti-work, or post-work. Today, while I will not go further into these schools of thought, however, I will underline the fact that the contemporary emphasis on artistic activity as work draws its strength from the 1970s feminist critique of the politics of work, which rightfully relocated the domain of work beyond factory to the domestic realm housework. And I'm alluding to Sylvia Frederick's landmark Wages Against Housework publication in 1974. Often this title is misquoted for its implied import as wages for housework. The use of the word against is very nuanced here, as Silva clearly suggests that wages for housework were simultaneous wages against housework, highlighting the contradiction. Some theorists and critics have argued, quote, the political imaginary of the 21st century is marked by the rejection of Herbert Marcuse's proposition that artistic labor prefigures the non-alienated labor of society no longer crippled by the pursuit of accumulation and domination, which has been sustained and extended by a Hegelian strand of Marxism in the 70s and 80s, unquote. I'm very interested in examining the broader culture domain and its multitude of culture forms as they relate to the economic formations after the structural transitions initiated in the 70s. In the United States, especially the 70s and 80s were key moments as post-World War II compact between labor and capital began to break down, and this also manifested in the shifts observed in cultural production. Lee Claire Laberge calls it the financialization of labor. The idea of decommodified labor in this context becomes interesting. In simple terms, decommodified labor implies the removal from a market economy in a way of speaking, and one sees the courtesy of financialization, the growth of institutions for art education, as artists are told to invest in themselves and they go into debt for an art education. The point being, an individual is to organize one's life in such a way 
as to be able to sell, but the irony is that much of artistic labor cannot be sold and hence is removed from the market. It's actually decommodified labor. As Lee cleverly puts it, quote, it was a way to combine the failure of the neoliberal imperative to invest in oneself with the two totalizing Marxist claims of the real subsumption of labor to capital, essentially that all life is now labor. So thus we see commodified labor is almost synonymous to precarious work. And as I said in the opening of this segment, the world of labor looks a lot like the way art labor has looked for decades. This is the central tension to have access to the time and space to make art outside the commodified or social relations because one needs money to survive. And to get that money, one needs to sell one's labor for which one has to exist in the market in the first place. And artists live this tension and their work manifests it. So the question facing us is, what are the compatible ecologies for decommodified labor? Closely related to this notion of decommodified labor is digital labor. This is a growing area of research where the focus is theorizing digital labor and virtual work, definitions, dimensions, and forms. And as scholar Mize says, quote, digital labor on social media resembles housework because it has no wages and it is mainly conducted during spare time, has no trade union representation, and is difficult to perceive as being labor. Like housework, it involves the externalization or exterritorialization of costs, which otherwise would have to be covered by the capitalists. The term crowdsourcing expresses exactly an outsourcing process that helps capital to save on labor costs. Like housework, digital labor is a source of unchecked, unlimited exploitation. As you can see on the screen, alluding to digital labor, Michel Giras says it is a major issue arising from the convergence of technology, the academy, and labor. It is the increasing vocationalization of the liberal arts. In the last two decades, as we have seen IT join hands with the market, making it the winner-take-all models, as William Doratsowitz says, and as I mentioned earlier, And he has precisely written on this new paradigm in the digital age, one that is changing our fundamental ideas about the nature of art and the role of artists in society. One year ago, William and I had the opportunity to speak together on a podcast, how we're embedded in an IT and market paradigm, which is dictating the terms, i.e. the platform economy. At the core of entrepreneurial societies, the question remains how to generate sustained and sustainable economic growth built on high-value, well-paying jobs. In our pursuit of harnessing the digital ecosystem, the platform economy, we also have to keep an eye on how there's a restructuring of what would be considered as a delivery of cultural services. A new reconfiguration of sports, entertainment, and tourism is recasting cultural planning and thus communities in a different mode. Let's take a pause. Let these thoughts settle as we explore another element. Can commitment to the idea of decommodified labor in the arts, we see a similar prevalence in the amateur sports sector. An amateur sports person is in the same boat as the artist. What we have seen here is that the festivalization of culture, which began post-Washington consensus courtesy the banalization of art as part of the global dislocation of art labor on the one hand, and on the other, embedding itself as a central plank of urban and cultural policy. What began with the impetus of the creative economy dovetailed into the global cities paradigm of cultural planning. This is where the festivals became the central feature of urban policy. And now we see this resulted into the sports, entertainment, and tourism complex. And we see its, its consolidation now. Framed within a broader array of neoliberal culture-led urban regeneration strategies, festivals are now a mainstay of urban tourism and urban policymaking. Various commentators have pointed out that the use of culture to advance a range of social and economic goals is most apparent in cities and urban art festivals have proliferated to a greater degree than any other type. The heightened series of tensions between the policy domains that these festivals increasingly straddle and hence competing agendas have to be managed. And the tourism sector in particular is very forthright in its instrumental approach to culture 
and to arts festivals. McCannell in 1992 asserted that tourism is not just an aggregate of merely commercial activities. It is also an ideological framing of history, nature, and tradition, a framing that has the power to reshape culture and nature to its own needs is a real issue for the festival sector. And amid such competitive pressures and competing agendas, the need for a set of coherent goals and policy frameworks is vital. Thus, the focus is constantly trying to answer the question, how well do festivals serve the interests of urban destinations? And how are festivals faring in the context of prevailing urban policy agendas? While the report on the impact of this crisis on arts is predicated on a box office model, the idiom of tourism has established itself as central to the idea of arts, along with the concomitant fact of the festivalization of culture as the norm across Canada. A public policy context in which art and culture function is not a priority either for the politicians or even the scores of artists and cultural workers who do not comprehend the politics of culture or the institutions that they engage with. This is complicated by the ambivalent nature of a cultural policy itself, let alone a more nuanced understanding of its differentiation from an arts policy, and thus resulting in the poverty of public discourse. Yet, every generation has their actors who end up fighting the cultural battles, often reinventing the wheel. For some, the exasperation stems not only from the feeling of living in a loop reality, but through the fact that presents Canadian art as a fait accompli. The pandemic has brought on a new set of protagonists to the fore, a new generation that is addressing this crisis. Given the bigger picture of the political economy, let us now move on to some foundational armature of culture in Canada. You guessed it right. I'm going to devote some time to the Massey Commission. The final report of Canada's Massey Commission, the Royal Commission on National Development of the Arts, Letters and Sciences, was released in 1951. Often referred to as the Massey Report, this document provided the armature of what would be defined national culture in Canada and gave birth to the idea of Canadian content as an act of cultural sovereignty. It was part of what was broadly known as the building of national cultures, a definitive trajectory that many nations followed post-World War II. On its 70th anniversary, it is imperative we take stock of how far we have come and how we can build together a path forward for a better tomorrow and a stronger Canada. The Massey Report has been a significant part of my professional life. I've engaged with it in different fora and contexts addressing its multiple audiences. And this includes my lived interactions both with the Massey Report represents as well as my interventions in the domain of cultural policy highlighting three points. The notion of, of a live document, the idea of agency and change, and the idea of the public good. I've been drawn to the Massey Report, not as a currency of cathaxis, but rather as a contemporary political problem and more in terms of a philosophical problem in such a way that is difficult to disarticulate one from the other. The 1967 Confederation of Tomorrow Conference marked the beginning of the period of intense constitutional politics in Canada. In the wake of the failed Meech Lake Accord in 1990, Canada's political leaders got together for one more attempt at securing Quebec support for the new constitution, which had been reformed eight years earlier. The result in 1992 was the Charlottetown Accord, developed with input from these various groups, along with the federal and provincial governments. It proposed a plethora of changes to the constitution, some of which were criticized for being ill-defined contradictory or a threat to individual rights and national unity. Let us look at arts and culture in the constitutional reform. On September 24, 1991, the Government of Canada tabled in the Federal Parliament a set of proposals for the renewal of the Canadian Federation entitled Shaping Canada's Future Together. These proposals were referred to a special joint committee of the House of Commons and the Senate which traveled across Canada seeking views on the proposals. This committee received 3,000 submissions and listened to testimony from 700 individuals. What does this imply about the constitutionality of culture? I'm indebted to Patrick Monaghan, the former Osgood Dean and York U. Provost and Ontario Deputy Attorney General, 
and now the judge of Superior Court for Justice in Ontario on his body of work on these contentious constitutional issues pertaining to culture. On page 35 of this document, the government outlines its position with regard to culture. I quote, Our challenge, therefore, is to ensure, on the one hand, the maintenance of important Canada-wide institutions that help us to promote our identity. On the other hand, Canada's cultural policies and jurisdictions must offer the flexibility of ensuring that the roots of culture are enhanced and enriched, and that there are no impediments to provincial governments playing the roles that they deem appropriate in the cultural field, end of quote. Further, it says, and this is consequential, that the government of Canada will therefore negotiate with the provinces upon their request agreements appropriate to the particular circumstances of each province to define clearly the role of each level of government. Where appropriate, such agreements would be constitutionalized. So the two communities that were identified and the art sector was mobilized was one, the Special Joint Committee on a Renewed Canada. And the second one was the Standing Committee on Communications and Culture. Now, Monaghan's writings and analysis of these issues, especially during the times of the Charlottetown Accord referendum, were insightful and influenced my understanding. I just want to pick on the deliberations of the Standing Committee on Communications and Culture and point two key observations. It significantly, it noted that the Constitution is silent on the issue of jurisdiction over culture. However, it clarified that provinces generally were to retain control over provincial and local matters, which would invariably include culture. And the second, it explored the idea of a cultural accord as a partnership between all levels of government, but it did not offer any specifics. However, the committee recommended that cultural accord could not be constitutionalized. And what I'm trying to drive your attention to the fact is that what the committee says is that culture is not a category with any constitutional significance under the 1967 Constitutional Act. Either level of government is perfectly free to enact laws which might directly affect culture as long as there's an appropriate constitutional foundation for such laws in the Act. One may ask, why? Often defined in terms of the collective way of being, the term culture is indeterminate and all-encompassing, and that its inclusion would have rendered the entire division of powers almost incoherent. So as we know, these things are decided by courts and not politicians. One thing we all need to understand is that there are mechanisms for the federal government, like direct spending programs through which it counters its influence of the provincial responsibility of the culture sector. So let's check, where are we now? Have you noticed how every country, especially in the West, has functioned in a similar manner, whether in response to the pandemic or the ensuing economic crisis? In their mimicking, we see how the idea of politics has been reduced to administering and governance, wherein the agency of individuals has been taken away and an ontology of war unleashed on the subjects to produce an unified political subject and an external enemy. Now, that's the classic binary. And you can see quotes of Greek intellectual Sartorius in his influential essay, or as Salman Rushdie says in his recent book of essays, The Languages of Truth, quote, the breakdown in the old agreements about reality is now the most significant reality. Reality is not just simply something given. I would say it is an argument and always has been. He alludes to the fact that consensus-based argument about reality is particularly worrisome, polluted by propaganda and misinformation. And we are now seeing this in the growing rise of populism across the world and many claims to reality. As scholars have argued, quote, that the main affect that the nation state tries to manage in relation to the pandemic through the ontology of war is anxiety. They argue that the need to alleviate anxiety by framing it through the ontology war. And this leads to the appearance of a potentially racist and nationalistic affective climate where the enemy is no longer felt to be the virus, but members of other nations as well as minorities. They argue that the pandemic reveals both the political ontology of war is central to the foundation of our political communities and how this ontology is used by the nation state to manage feelings of anxiety and insecurity, unquote. 
So the question is here, where does art fit into this reality? The scenario method or scenario questions are often posed either by journalists or politicians or recruiters. Here is one such response to the next five-year scenario that I was posed to in the context of a policy interview by an organization. This was in 2016 in an interview with CPAML. For policymakers, there are no easy off-the-shelf answers. The policy environment in the late pandemic and post-pandemic era poses new obstacles to effective policy development unless we adapt. A new report from the CSA, which is a think tank, uh, the Public Policy Center report in September 2022 delineates the challenges and drivers of the complexity of the policy environment. The 10 drivers of change are and have been unfolding in Canada and many other countries for decades. Some of these drivers, such as climate change, increasingly fragile social and healthcare systems, represent challenges that can be attributed to past policy decisions or inaction, while others, like digitization and shifting demographics, reflect the broader technological and societal trends. These drivers represent both long-term challenges and specific trends shaping Canada's future. Each has a distinct impact that they combine to create cumulative compounding effects that lead to lower trust, increasing complexity, and a more certain policy environment. Let me just elaborate on the first of the drivers, declining trust. The first category of drivers represents challenges and trends that are contributing to declining trust in the ability of public institutions to meet needs and demands of societal change. Growing inequality and financial insecurity, fraying social safety net, healthcare system vulnerabilities, reconciliation and social justice. And what we see is that these four are directly impacting the arts. If there is such a decline in trust, the obvious question is, how does one engage in rebuilding trust? And central to rebuilding trust is critical listening. The erosion of trust in institutions fundamentally undermines the ability to govern when people feel as though they're being left behind and believe the government is ill-equipped or unwilling to make meaningful change, the public withdraws support. The lack of diverse perspectives in decision-making results in policies that often fail to adequately serve those most in need, further eroding confidence, widening the chasm between needs and available programs and services. Governments must prioritize meaningful engagement, strengthened collaboration, and improved program and service de delivery as they work to foster greater trust and confidence. Making judgments during listening is often considered as a barrier to understanding a person. While experts on learning and communication almost universally demean the importance and value of critical listening when it comes to real life, listening critically is used every day. And the key is to try to understand the other person first before one evaluates. We've done a lot of work on bias our communities. When listeners have strong pre-existing opinions about a topic, such as the death penalty, religious issues, affirmative action, abortion, global warming, their biases may make it difficult for the new information about the topic, especially if the new information is, is inconsistent with what they think or believe. So if listening is so crucial, then one can ask the obvious question, how do we challenge the settled consensus or the recited truths? How can we be more disruptive? How does listening align with individual conviction and the public need? There is always a tension between individual conviction and listening to the public's need. The policy world favors the status quo for a reason. How do we understand change or how do we change our thinking about the status quo? And I think it behooves us to ask the question, how does change happen in society? There are many forces at play, broadly speaking. One is violence. Violence is often understood ordering and disordering mechanism, war, genocide. These are key examples that change societies. Number two is a pandemic. Well, we saw that and we saw how historically this has played this role. The environment, ecology and nature, hence the climate crisis is really significant for us. And technology also has an iterative role in making change, but more so in sustaining one. So how can we be disruptive? How can we challenge the settled consensus or the recited truths? For example, we're continuously told multiculturalism is good, while philosophically it's a defunct idea. Another example is let's talk about gender in politics. 
And, you know, we can see it in reportage, how when the Honorable Anita Anand was, was reported, she was simply reported as a woman minister for national defense. Her name was not even mentioned. So how do we define these shifts in thinking? 1962, Thomas Kuhn, an important 20th century philosopher, wrote the structure of scientific revolutions explained, and I'm paraphrasing it now for you, was that knowledge does not grow in a linear cumulative manner. It rather emerges in frameworks, which he termed paradigms. Paradigms are conceptual models and they govern the activities in their field, but paradigms are not immutable. They mutate and are replaced by others. Much of our current thinking in public management and public policy stems from the early 80s and it seems to have run its course. We need to comprehend the anomalies that it is not able to address. For instance, the growing involuntary movement of people, refugees, the idea of the 99%, the widening gap between the rich and poor, death by hunger, so you kind of get my drift. And what I'm trying to say is that procedural thinking cannot produce any change. We cannot be simply managerial in approaching these challenges. Apart from ideological premise, one of the critical factor one needs to address is assumption. I was fortunate to encounter General Hillier in one of our sessions on leadership at the Canada Public Service School a few decades ago. And after going through his presentation on leadership, I walked up to him and I was really occupied with this sort of piercing thought. How does an army general make decisions of whom to send or not to war? And this is not just a simple question of management and leadership. It's philosophical. Even Michel Foucault speaks about it on the role of the nation state, who is allowed to live and who is allowed to die. General Hillier said in a very calm manner, what assumption am I making that I'm not aware I'm making that gives me what I see? And then he paused and mentioned the second part. What might I now invent that I have not invented that would give me other choices. And what I'm driving is the notion of assumption and our assumptions and not knowing what we're assuming could be a key factor in the practice of our listening, or it may even not allow us to see something different, to come together in a different way. The capacity to imagine. This brings us to another aspect of my argument, which is the capacity to imagine. I think central to the enterprise today is how to rethink reason, truth, doing, thought, being. The answers are pegged on our capacity to imagine. Are we allowed to imagine? Can we build our capacities to imagine? Do we have sites for imagination or have they all become endangered? Access to our imagination. Now we come across this buzzword of innovation, which is an applied approach to the binary of problem and solution. Imagination is in short supply. One can trace it to the central constitutive tensions of modernity between reason and imagination, which offers competing versions of reality. The modern understanding of the imagination as authentically creative is one of the preconditions for contemporary elucidations of social imaginaries. How do we understand the link between imagination and the imaginary? Kathleen Lennon explores these links between imagination, regarded as the faculty of creating images of forms and the imaginary, which links such imagery with affect or emotion and captures the significance which the world carries for us. These are some of the fundamental questions, such as whether there is a distinction between the perceived and the imagined, the relationship between the imagination and creativity, and the role of the body in perception and imagination. While in my inquiry, I've drawn more about the role of the imaginary plays in the formation of the self and the social world. And I've drawn upon writers that, you know, the works of Castordius and Paul Ricoeur and Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor. Castordius uses the concept of the imaginary to describe how societies tend to construct mythologies around social orders and means of production. The imaginary is essentially social and transcends the individual subjective representation. It is a cultural ethos. It is a domain of signification that emerges ex nihilo, out of history and does not refer to anything particular or immediate. Rather, it produces significations that organize human behavior and reinforce social relations. He offers an interesting way out, and he says, rather than searching for an absolute truth, we are, when thinking, engaging in human creation in order to be able to encounter the real. 
when entering the metaphorical labyrinth to explore the real, we simultaneously create new interconnecting corridors to negotiate. And he adds that this is our life world, the social and historical world, as it is given in our experience and understanding, whose reality we come to know only in fragments as we articulate and problematize it and debate its meaning. And this requires what he called thoughtful doing, on which the further development of our social, cultural, and historical world depends. I think on the other hand, social imaginaries offer a handle to the way that the social, cultural, and political phenomenon are understood and problematized. Explorations of social imaginaries compromise inquiries not only into horizons of cultural meaning that fundamentally shape each society, but also into their further articulation as instituted and instituting cultural projects of power and social doing. Other scholars like Adams and Smith have highlighted in debates over social imaginaries and, quote, it marks a quality qualitative shift in the way that social, cultural, and political phenomena are understood and problematized. Investigations into social imaginaries redefine overarching ontological, epistemological, and anthropological problematics on the one hand, and concrete, political, and social on the other. Let me identify three key aspects in discussing this. One, that social imaginaries emphasize the properly social aspect of the imagination instead of reducing it to a faculty of the individual mind. This is the difference between imaginary and the imagination. It can also be extended to the difference between rationality and reason. Two, that social imaginaries grasp the imagination as authentically creative rather than merely reproductive or imitative. And three, as social imaginaries take society to be a political institution, it emphasizes the situated nature and collective forms of social interaction, in particular regarding democratic politics and the capitalist market in economy. In a related vein, it does not reduce analyses of social formations and projects of power to normative considerations alone. But this audience might wonder then how to bring about the change. And Arjun Padurai, anthropologist, he famously phrased imagination as a social practice. This enables performing alternatives. Artists play a principal role in the ability of society to inaugurate new forms of itself, as well as to rehearse alternative ways of being, offering perspectives and experiences that counter and exceed the dominant social and cultural forms. And Barbara Adams writes, in creating material objects, such as stories, songs, public spaces, artworks, even policies and scientific experiments, meals and social events, we produce not just the artifacts themselves, but also the undeniable recognition that we share a world in common. In materializing the world, artists, poets, historiographers, monument builders, writers, creative practitioners, including all of us, provide a home where we can gather to create a world and build a future. The public square, the library, the table, the museum, the garden, the sidewalk, the theater, and the neighborhood provide space where people can convene, collaborate, and create the worlds in which they would like to live. Greg de Puture and et al. have done tremendous research responding to precisely the nature of work that ASOs undertook during the pandemic. Their thematic analysis of this empirical material reveals, quote, that cultural workers responded to the pandemic by surfacing the idea of cultural production as work, by enacting practices of care and mutual aid, and by proposing policy changes. These collective responses are marked by multiple tensions particularly between rehabilitating the status quo in the cultural sector and radically reimagining it for a post-COVID-19 world, unquote. This was the classic instance of policy from below can be foregrounded and impact status quo. A lot of work has been undertaken and the following four clusters emerge as a site of work for all of us. New urgencies and new priorities, data, database decision-making, the digital ecosystem, communication, which is a centralized communicative armature for engaging with the public and being collaborative, working as a new matrix oriented for all the members towards defining new ways of doing our business and producing public value. 
And I think this has to be seen in the broader context of what I laid out in the form of the political economy of the sector very early on in this talk. Drawing on the spirit of the Massey report, I think we're faced with clear choices to act on. One of the central notions of the Massey, that of the public good and commons is at risk today. The demise of the Canadian Conference of the Arts in 2012 is a case in point. A multidisciplinary national arts advocacy body, which was formed four years prior to the Massey, was the voice of art as a public good. We need to build nationwide literacy of the arts and cultural institutions. Art has been instrumentalized to serve the private good. Similarly, public institutions and especially cultural ones are facing a tremendous uphill task given the intergenerational loss of historical knowledge of these public institutions. Much is not reflected in the curriculum across secondary and post-secondary entities. And this has been a direct bearing upon the public policy discourse, which becomes an act of regurgitating and an exercise of reinventing the wheel. Given the ascendancy of neoliberalism since the 80s, we see the spirit and ethos of the public good and commons have been chipped away. Restoring their centrality is paramount to safeguarding the very fabric and idea of democracy. Thus, ASOs have their work cut out for them. The challenges are immense given the likely cuts next year how we're able to pool in resources in four verticals of digital data, collaborative and communication. And significantly, we need to go beyond the rhetoric and grapple with deeper systemic issues as identified here to offer a systemic approach to the new role of ASOs in reimagining the arts sector. I wanted to end with this slide, which is written by Lord Melbourne in his self-evident truths of public policy for the 19th century British and colonial politicians. And he says, God help the minister that meddles with art. I just want to thank you all for listening to my thoughts so patiently. I have taken everyone on a long journey to put into place the political economy in, in which we are situated. And we cannot change the status quo without that understanding of what actually it is. You know, we talk about we have to change the Massey. Well, it's going to be difficult because of the legal aspect that surround it. But we do have to focus on how can we reimagine differently the idea of the public good and the things I said at the end, what are the four things that we can come around together on to make these shifts? But it'll include critical listening. It'll mean we have to think about our biases. We have to understand what the system's noises are at our table. But anyway, I want to just thank everybody for listening and especially thank you, Robin and Mass Culture for this opportunity to speak. Mm -hmm.